it's one o'clock and we want to stick to the schedule, so uh, let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sten Bonke. I'm an associate professor at ETU Management Engineering. My role here today is to chair today's uh, PhD defense session and to moderate the actions. I expect that to be an easy task. You all, you all look like decent people. Let's see what happens. My first duty is to welcome all the participants present. Uh, let me start with uh, the assessment committee, the examiners, uh, in which uh, we have two external guests. Uh, from Tampere University in Finland, Suvi Nenonen, sitting here. Second, uh, sorry, I forgot to tell that you are a research manager, a reader or docent, uh, and a senior consultant, is that correct? Yes. Second, uh, we have from uh, uh, NTNU, Norway's Technisk Naturvidenskabelige Univers Universitet, uh, in Trondheim, Professor Geier Hansen, Carsten Hansen, to be correct, yes. And uh, third, from our own premises here at DTU Management Engineering, Associate Professor Susanne Balslev Nielsen. So that's the examiners. Welcome to all of you. And then uh, next, uh, let me present the main character today, uh, the PhD student who will stand up to defend her research work, Anita Fonsex Munter. Welcome to you, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you very much. Uh, you may sit down a few minutes. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, also among the primary involved persons are, of course, the supervisors. Uh, the main supervisor is Professor Pia Anker Jensen from the Center for Facilities Management the, at DTU Management Engineering. Secondly, uh, we have present here today uh, Dr. Jorian van Meel, sitting here, senior researcher at CFM and also a partner in ICOP, which I forgot to, what is that abbreviation for? We don't want to know. No, okay, <laughs> we don't want to know. But it's probably very important then. <laughs> ICOP. Okay. Uh, there is actually also, uh, there was a, a third supervisor by the name of Werner Speerschneider. He could not be present today, unfortunately. And finally, of course, a warm welcome to all of you uh, present in the audience. Now, before we start, uh, just a few words about the defense session and the protocol. Uh, Anita's presentation has uh, the announced title, it's actually already now, <laughs> on the whiteboard, Usability Briefing for Hospital Design, Exploring User Needs and Experiences to Improve Complex Building. In some versions of the invita invitation, I saw that exploring was like capturing mm -hmm. instead, but uh, maybe there's an important difference. We'll find out. Uh, this, uh, this presentation, of course, relates to the PhD research work uh, and the dissertation, which carries the same title. Uh, we have already learned about the supervisors. Uh, I can further add to that that the study has been carried out at the centers, Center for Facilities Management at the DTU Management Engineering Department uh, under the PhD program with the easy name of Construction, Production, Civil Engineering and Transport. Uh, as you may know, in continuation of Anita's presentation, which is scheduled to last 45 minutes, there will be a short break. It will be 10 minutes, and there will be coffee for you outside, I'm informed. And after that, we will meet for the questioning part of the session, which uh, we will come back to after the break and, and uh, be more precise about what is going to happen. But let me just finally announce that, uh, that if anybody among you in the audience wants to ask a question or have a comment uh, to Anita's research work, work, please inform me during the break. 
As you know, also the total uh, time for this formal part of the defense uh, is three hours. That is until four o'clock. Uh, something happens afterwards, and I'll come back to, to that uh, when we have gone that far. So now let me give the floor to you, Anita. Thank you very much. Yeah, good luck. Welcome, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I have made, okay, maybe I should present myself. My name is Aneta Franczak Munter, and I have been ma making a PhD study here at uh, Danish uh, Technical University at Center of Facilities Management. Uh, and let's go straight to it. I will start with uh, presenting what is the PhD project about, um, what is the background, and why is it relevant. Uh, later, I'll introduce the methodology, uh, research design, and uh, the theories I have been studying, and what kind of papers I have presented and published. And uh, further, I'll present my hospital cases. There was three of the main hospital cases. And I'll first introduce them with some pictures, so have a quick overview. And later, I will present what are the results of those case studies. And uh, the topics that I was uh, interested in, there were user involvement and innovation, evaluation methods, usability, uh, briefing, and design. And we will uh, finish with um, me presenting the, a new process of usability briefing that I developed. And I will explain it, and we'll finish with conclusions and discussion. We start. The PhD project, uh, I'll just uh, say the title again, Usability Briefing for Hospital Design, Exploring User Needs and Experiences to Improve Complex Buildings. And I'll maybe explain this, the exploring instead of capturing. Uh, the capturing was previously, but then I found out the exploring is less uh, strict. There can be more capturing. It sounds like there is just one uh, user needs that we need to capture, but there is maybe many, a variety of needs, so you have to explore them. That is the difference. So we start with the background. Why, why do I want to study all this? Uh, hospitals. We will all visit them sooner or later. <laughs> so they are pretty important for the society. Uh, furthermore, the hospitals, they are complex buildings. They have uh, very complicated technology often. They also have many different kinds of users. Uh, furthermore, they also sometimes have contradictory requirements. So therefore, it's uh, very important to, to see if there's some ways to improve the design and briefing of those uh, uh, hospitals. Then, uh, if we know why it's interesting, let's go further with how I want, wanted to study that. So we will discuss the methodology, research design, and theories and papers. Start with the research questions. I have two main research questions. The first one, how can usability briefing be conducted and what should it include? That's the main research question. And the other one, how to capture this user needs and experiences and specifically at healthcare facilities. And then I have divided them in some sub-questions, a little more detailed. So how can the briefing process be organized in hospital design and complex buildings across all the building design phases to help create usable buildings? Which kind of activities should occur in the different phases? Another one, what should the process of briefing focus on in the different phases? Which methods can be used for effective user involvement in the different phases of the briefing and design process? Which users to involve and when? How do you choose the appropriate building evaluation method? And maybe for the different phases or for the different focus? What to evaluate when and why? How can the results of those kind of, for example, usability evaluations, how can they be transformed to briefing and design processes? So that is all those questions we need to study. I have divided them in five research topics, uh, themes, you could say. 
defined by usability, user involvement in innovation, briefing, that is also called architectural programming in USA, design of hospitals, and evaluation of buildings. And I have been studying those themes, uh, research themes, and I have been publishing five papers. And as you see, some of them, for example, paper one, was focusing on the first two themes. The paper two was going a little broader, and paper three and four. And the last paper, the paper five, it was a synthesis of, uh, of, the, of the five uh, topics and of all the previous uh, ca both cases and papers. And the last one proposes this usability briefing process model. So far, so good. <laughs> The papers, uh, the five papers I just mentioned, the titles were uh, Usability and User-Driven Innovation, Unity or Clash, where I was digging into are those two concepts working with each other or con contradicting maybe. Uh, paper two, Towards an Agenda for User-Oriented Research in the Built Environment. Uh, paper three, Facilitating User-Driven Innovation, a study of methods and tools at Hello Hospital, that was just one. Uh, paper four, Evaluation Methods for Hospital Facilities. And paper five, Usability Briefing, a conceptual, a conceptual process model based on hospital projects. And then I have also made uh, and published two other papers. The first one uh, was the a popular article, therefore it's not included in the printed version. And the second paper was a preliminary version of the paper five. Uh, that is almost the same, but I have improved the model and made a new version. Uh, so the first four papers here are, uh, three are conference papers and the last two are journal papers. And it means I talk about those papers because this is a PhD that is paper-based. Therefore, I have a book only combining all the things that I have already published in some articles, papers. Uh, therefore, the papers are quite uh, important for the PhD. Um, there are... Mm, yeah, maybe how to start. The sounders uh, have uh, combined um, many different approaches, philosophies and strategies in one uh, map uh, showing the philosophy of science and what are the different choices we can take. And here it visually shows this, uh, his map, it's called Research Onion, uh, where researchers can uh, find which are actually their uh, choices. I have marked uh, with the red line the choices I have taken uh, through my uh, research. So if we start with the philosophy, the outermost layer of the onion, uh, there's many different, we can choose positivism, interpretivism, realism. I think I'm closest to this interpretivism where the research is qualitative, subjective and humanist. Uh, then uh, the next layer is the uh, approach. Uh, and in my case, in the research I have been conducting, it was both inductive and abductive. Where inductive, it means that particular ex examples, they are used to reach a general conclusion. And the abductive means that I am aware of that there is both interaction and also mutual development, both of theory and of the empirical field. So things I do while studying the cases might actually change the, how the cases are uh, for going further on. Uh, in the next layer, we have the strategies. And here, the main one by me is case study. But I also use, in some cases, ethnography and a little bit of archi archival, archival research. Um, and then the research is also qual qualitative. And uh, in the... I also use both, to some extent, cross-sectional and longitudinal study. Longitudinal because I follow my case studies over a couple of years, so it's quite long. But also cross-sectional because I have a number of cases. And then in the data collection, the data analyzes all 
tell you a little later about. Um, there is something called triangulation of both data and methods uh, that Uwe Flick was writing about. Um, and triangulation of empirical data, it means that um, people write that most single study, they, have, they are flawed in some way. Uh, therefore, it's, uh, it's impor important or it might be stronger to use a series of studies, which I did. Uh, then each study might have some flaws, but together they might give more generals, general <laughs> generalizable results. And therefore, multiple studies uh, are encouraged that I did. So the three main case studies were Healthcare Innovation Lab, I will present that later, Bispebier Hospital, that I will refer to as BH, and St. Olaf's Hospital, also with some Part of those three main case studies, I also made a number of expert interviews outside of those case studies. And uh, altogether, I have 140 documented events that were both expert interviews or workshops, many different types. So that was empirical data. But there's also methods. You can also use a triangulation of methods, which I did. So the main ones are, there's both case studies, as I mentioned already. Uh, so getting empirical data from hospital projects. Another one was literature study. I also get a lot of data from literature study. What are others writing about all those themes? Existing research of the concept. And respo and also reports from some of the hospital projects. And expert interviews, as I mentioned before. Uh, and I have made, of course, expert interviews in the case studies as well, but also uh, additional uh, expert interviews from other companies. Um, there was also a couple of study visits in other hospitals that I was not studying further for longer period. Uh, and there was also workshops uh, organized both by me and by others for example, the Danish client organization. And finally, I also have made a focus group workshop where I made a validation and further development of this usability model that I'll present. So there was many different methods you could say I was using. What were the theories I was studying? Uh, I have introduced them shortly with this five uh, themes, but now we'll go a little deeper. So what is usability? Um, usability is first and sort of the quality of a building, but it's also sometimes referred to as relationship between people and buildings. Uh, it consists of the usability is like the building, it should for the first support and shelter the users. But a part of that, it should also contribute to a fixed efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction of the people using the buildings, the users. It depends also on context, culture, situation, and experience. And here I have a little example. For example, uh, during the World War II, at some point in '43, if I remember correctly, the British Parliament House of Commons, I think it was called, was bombed, totally ruined uh, by the Nazis. Uh, then the Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, decided we should rebuild it as soon as possible in exactly the same form, even though there was some uh, voices to say, hmm, let's rebuild it a little bigger. It was actually quite too small because it was an old building. But he decided no, we should show to the world. For the first, it is very important that we say we British people are standing for what we are and show our history and rebuild, we rebuild it exactly the same place as it used to be. For the second, we don't want to build it bigger. Let's rebuild it the same way. If we come here to vote on, a, on, on the important things, then there's a very strong uh, showing the... the urgency. All the people voting will come and even though they cannot sit 
uh, because there's not enough chairs. They will vote because it's so important things they have to decide on. So we see that mm, the usability and functionality are not exactly the same because it will be functional to make it bigger, but the situation and context was saying something else. Um, so there's also additionally the, the definition between functionality that we architects love to talk about and usability because the subjective view of the users is also very important. They might think something else than I or you. Another topic what I'll present in uh, one of the research themes is the user involvement and user-driven innovation. And uh, here uh, I adapted a map from Saunders uh, where she is showing um, many different kinds of view to uh, user involvement. Because we all, many people talk about user involvement, but they can mean different things by it. So here it's a different map to uh, help us understand what we talk about. So there's an axis, a horizontal one. On the one side we have the users, they are seen as subjects. They will tell us some information and we are the experts asking them questions. On the other side, users, they are partners. We want to co-create co with them. They are actively involved. There's also another axis. There's the focus on the design and focus on, us on research. So here we're interested in getting knowledge, understanding. Here we're interested in the results of the involvement, the design of things or buildings. So there we can place all the different well-known ways to involve users. As you see, the biggest one is the user-centered design. We are often saying, oh, the patient is in the center or the user is in the center, or the pupils in the school are in the center. And that often means that uh, we are inviting the patient or the uh, student to, tell, to answer some questions, and then we get the knowledge and design further ourselves. On the other side, there's, for example, the participatory design, and the Scandinavian version of it that is very popular in Scandinavia and Denmark also to a large extent. Uh, here, the users are co-creators. They want to. They are participate, participating in an active way. Say what they mean. There is a lot of exchange of knowledge. There is also marked the something in between those two: the user-driven innovation, which includes both the Scandinavian part. It includes also a method of applied ethnography, where you for example, shadow and walk around the users to find out why they do things in a cer certain way. Uh, but there's also in a small uh, circle showing lead user innovation that I will show in one of the cases. Uh, lead users are that kind of users that are ahead of the majority. They know some more things about a specific subject. Um, so the first... Uh, known lead users were, for example, some computer nerds that were starting uh, making their own programs. But they can also be lead users of buildings where they know more about specific uh, subjects. Uh, another uh, theory I can uh, explain is what is boundary objects. I use that uh, term. Uh, it was first described by uh, in 89 as it was uh, objects used for problem solving by means of translation. Or otherwise, it was both media of communication and it could be both abstract or concrete objects. Uh, there was many different researchers writing about it and I will use the term boundary objects as different tools, objects and techniques that we can use uh, for the workshops with the users. Uh, and I'll focus on how well they help both the communication but also the innovation, the, the uh, result in the design. Another uh, topic that is important when we talk about buildings is briefing. Uh, the briefing is usually understood as one of the first 
uh, phases of the, the building project. And if we see here the building projects, then people usually understood it as one phase somewhere here. But many researchers have been writing about that it's actually a continuous pro uh, process. And it can be divided into some specific steps, starting, for example, with a strategic brief, somewhere here, and then functional brief with more details, and then detailed briefs with technical, operational, and fit-out briefs. So it's, there's actually a number of different briefs going on. What this picture is showing us is that there's also some kind of feedback going on. So we don't just sit in the office and write these briefs. We need to talk with maybe users. We have to get some kind of feedback. And I was very inspired by that model and will present my model uh, later on. What could this uh, feedback be? Um, we can also uh, tra uh, compare the traditional briefing and this usability briefing that I propose. And there's a number of differences. For the first, uh, as I mentioned already, traditionally the briefing is a one little phase, a definite phase uh, of the building projects. Whereas, I don't know if you see, uh, in the usability briefing, this would be a process that is continuous and it con continues um, in all the phases and it just changing focus. Another one, I'll maybe not go through all of it. Um, the traditionally, it will also be the expert based information collection in the briefing. Whereas in the usability briefing, we can maybe go closer to this Scandinavian way of user involvement and have the co-learning and a dialogue process with the users. So there will be more this feedback, uh, will be more active way. And now we go to some other uh, subject. Another uh, topic and research uh, theme would be the evaluation. That's another way of getting feedback about buildings. But there is 150 different exist existing techniques of evaluating buildings. And the POE techniques, it means post-occupancy evaluations, meaning that we evaluate buildings after the users have moved in and start using it. Then we can see how well it works. Uh, I have studied 55 of them, of them uh, and organized them in paper for all those P's are showing where I have described that. So I have described this evaluation things in paper form. Um, I have made a evaluation focus flower. So I try to uh, organize them according to what kind of focus they actually have because many of those evaluation uh, techniques, they say, hmm, yeah, we evaluate building. But do what there is often a specific focus, or they are best at evaluating some kinds of parts of the buildings. So I have started with the ancient three division of what is important in architecture. And there's first, beauty form. Secondly, durability or technology. And last, utility or usability, we could say. Then I have drawn some more petals of the flower. There is also some things in between. So there's, of course, in the beauty, there's the aesthetics, but there's also well-being and health, pretty important in all kinds of buildings, not only hospitals, environment, technical building performance, energy, climate, and the same when going to functionality, utility. There's both spatial organization and also effectiveness and efficiency, economy as well. And going somewhere in between aesthetics and functionality, there can be some psychology, experience, symbol, context. So you can see that many of the methods cannot possibly evaluate all those things at once. And here I marked uh, three different uh, methods that I uh, have observed in, some in my case studies. So for example, there was participatory methods and narratives. They are very good at getting the both the aesthetics but also symbol and experience. You can evaluate buildings with the focus on that. There's also a tool, use tool, uh, and another one, future scenarios, that is really good at looking at fun both functionality and user satisfaction. 
uh, another one. Use tool is also kind of usability walkthrough, but here was, was the focus on both the functionality and effectiveness and spatial organization. So you see, you can place many different uh, methods on the flower. Now we go from the series to the cases. Uh, I have three uh, main uh, hospital cases, and I will just quickly present, uh, present them in pictures. Later we'll add some more information. Uh, the first case was uh, Bispebje Hospital uh, here in Copenhagen area. Uh, it is an existing hospital. It contains many, many different uh, buildings that were listed, so we cannot rebuild them or change them or remove them. There is also a beautiful garden, as you see on the pictures. It looks like this. That was following a competition process. Another case, uh, St. Olof's Hospital in Norway. Um, important to say it was a winner of seven different awards uh, in 2014, among others as best international health project uh, of the big, big uh, hospitals. And uh, a few uh, were especially uh, important parts, the way the hospital design has been integrated in the city was considered in a very well uh, manner uh, solved, but also the use of art in the patient environment. And there was a couple of others. Uh, there is an overview. Some buildings, you see it looks like a city, uh, not, like a, not like a hospital. Um, there is both bike parking and places for sitting, and it's uh, accessible from anywhere. Um, there's also still a couple of uh, old buildings, so it's not only new build. Um, you see there's, in between those buildings, there's many of the special uh, bridges that are covered. And you see bus stops, people, both patients and people working there, just standing. It looks like a normal city. And the art inside, in the interiors, there's both, uh, yeah, you could see where is the part of the art and where is the architecture, but I could see it's like a very good visual identity everywhere. There's both pieces of art, but also flooring is special. There's some decoration on the walls. Uh, so there's many different visually appealing um, uh, parts. Another case, the third case, is called Healthcare Innovation Lab. Uh, it was uh, here in Denmark and it was a project uh, from the uh, capital region, which is Copenhagen and the area, and a number of hospitals, mainly uh, Hello Hospital, and a couple of others, and uh, private companies. It was a private, uh, public-private cooperation project. Uh, we had uh, a number of user workshops. It was, as you see in the title, Healthcare Innovation Lab. It was uh, a project focused on uh, how do we do uh, user-driven innovation in hospital projects. Are there some ways we can do it better? Um, what are the methods that are good for it? So we were testing many different methods in hospital settings. But I, a part of the three main cases, I was also making uh, many other things. So here, for example, there was some workshops by the Rückkehrvereinigung, the client organization of Denmark. Uh, I also made some uh, study visits to other hospitals abroad, for example, in Helsinki. And what have we learned from all of those cases? I have been observing and talking with people, interviewing. Uh, I will present some of the results now. So if we can uh, focus on some of the themes. So now we'll talk about user involvement, briefing and innovation in the cases. So in the case of St. Ohalos Hospital in Norway, 
in the youth involvement, uh, unlike in Denmark, they had successful patient involvement. They had many different uh, groups involving patients or consisting only of patients. Uh, but they also had some trouble. They, for example, had many, many different user workshops. For example, I got a number 150. And some of them were without user expectation management, ending with staff actually being unhappy with the finished hospital, even though it was voted the best hospital. So there was maybe uh, the way they were collecting uh, the requirements was maybe not managed properly. Uh, if you just keep asking the users, what do you want, what do you want, the list of the requirements is growing and then it's impossible to satisfy all of them, even when you have all the money. <laughs> so there was some learnings. Um, in the patient involvement, the, uh, the good experience was that it is possible because in many other countries, uh, patients are not uh, involved in a, a big um, amount because it's difficult and how can we talk with the patients and patient organization organizations they seem to be very political and big it's maybe too difficult to talk with them they had good experiences you just the good thing was like if you prepare well everything is possible uh, in the Bispebje hospital uh, I was uh, following both the process of briefing but also of the user involvement uh, and there's a number of important, uh, interesting uh, things we have, I have learned there. For example, in the brief, uh, they have made a brief that actually ended up talking openly about the dilemmas. They found out, for example, hmm, we have this beautiful garden. How can we at the same time build double of the square meters we have now and keep this beautiful garden? They will be coming cranes in and out while we're building. So there was a dilemma and many others like this. So they were included in the brief. They were not hidden away. In the user involvement, they had this lead user approach, as I mentioned before, where they tried to pick an, uh, uh, some users that are actually ahead of others. They know a little more or they are maybe also high in the hierarchy. Uh, in the user involvement, uh, they have... Uh, ended up with having only six user groups. They called them HIP, uh, I think it was Hospital Innovation Bispebje uh, groups. And the sh process was very short because they each of the groups met only three times. So they had to discuss the topic and discuss the requirements and uh, write them down. And it was very uh, intense uh, process. So I could say that was very managed, extremely kind of on the other part, uh, side of the uh, possibility. And the user themes, those six, they were also used in the program that was written program later for the competition. Another special thing we learned from that uh, BISPBR case is they had a continuous group. That was a special unit that was supposed to both meet in those groups, but also when this uh, process uh, continues and there's more uh, next building phases, that group will meet from time to time with the management and see, are those things still as we talked? So they, they have a hand on uh, how is the development going. In the healthcare innovation lab, as I mentioned before, we were studying many different types of uh, methods of how, how we can uh, involve users and what are the tools we can do the user-driven user innovation. And uh, I have made an article, uh, paper three, about how those different methods, how well they actually function. Uh, and here I use this boundary objects theme. So some of the tools and methods and tasks are uh, ending up being, ending up with some innovative ways and new ideas, and some are difficult to both understand and not lead to any new uh, solutions. Here I marked some of the some of the uh, best methods, um, and I'll give a little example. So one of the boundary objects 
here it was a design game. And I just com uh, will show you the contrasting results of a design game that is pretty similar, but though uh, very different. So the first design game was, I will just call it oval, ovals here. We had a printout uh, showing ovals, like here. If you don't see it very well, just like this. And um, we also had a number of icons of different kinds of view, uh, rooms or types of situation in the hospital. So there was, for example, oh, here there's a computer desk, but here you can see, okay, that, is, that must be a toilet, and some different things that can happen in a hospital, in different hospital rooms. But we also have like, different kinds of people, like a nurse and a doctor, and we have a patient, the person that can be walking around. And the thing was that uh, the users that were here mostly uh, doctors, uh, secret doctor secretaries and nurses, uh, the facilitators, there was researchers from DTU and a couple of private companies uh, designing hospitals and doing briefing. Uh, and here, they were, uh, the task was, hmm, there you go, uh, please tell us what the hospital of the future should have and let's focus on your department to start with. And they were discussing uh, mm, without any uh, more uh, input from us, they kind of knew that they should organize the rooms that are grouped together. So what should be close to what and many different things. So, oh, maybe there should be a toilet here close to the, this uh, room with the doctor and that kind of things. And while they were doing that, they also started uh, discussing totally new ideas. For example, actually this workshop ended up with uh, one of the uh, results was that the doctor secretary said, my job will not be existing in 10 years. She actually fired herself, <laughs> like not now, but she thought all those new things we're doing, it will be best if we actually don't have that job situation at all. So there was many different discussions ending up with new ideas, how to organize both uh, spatially, but also uh, organizationally, the hospital of the future. We thought we will go further to the next design game and go a little more detailed. So it was kind of the same game, but now it was squares. And we have divided the squares into two colors, yellow and blue, where yellow were accessible to the public or patients, and blue were kind of backstage, only doctors or other uh, stuff. And here there was also icons and uh, people, uh, uh, figures. And they were supposed to kind of continue with all the new ideas they got here. It was on the same day. Uh, and just go and make it a little more concrete, kind of going towards a little more architecture. But unfortunately, this one ended up with the same people that were discussing new ideas for the future, ended up fighting who is having the uh, window uh, uh, desk. Oh, I, I need the desk next to the window. So kind of totally different change of uh, the focus. So there was no new innovative ideas from this workshop. So then we can see some of the boundary objects we choose might actually at the first sight look similar, but they might and lead to different results. And there was many more like that. That is just one example. Um, now we focus on what are the case results with evaluation, evaluation methods. Uh, for example, in the Healthcare Innovation Lab, uh, here we also had some uh, simulation workshop with the same uh, group of people. It was a kind of simulation where it was tabletop. It was just at the table and we used cardboard boxes and figures uh, and we were simulating different kinds of layouts and organization uh, through the, pre we prepared to, uh, to start with the typical patient uh, treatments and what are the steps. There was some, for example, 10 different types of patients being ill of different things and how the procedure is then 
managed. So we were playing all that with uh, a clock, a timer, and uh, all the participants, and we were seeing how it well works with the different arrangements. Uh, and we were, of course, also focusing on the future. It should be the future spatial layout and future work organization. It actually ended up with being very time efficient. Uh, it was very easy to use for everybody, easy to understand. Um, and you could say it was a, a fine example of how evaluations and involvement of, the, of users can be at the same time. And also, it was also surprising to me that evaluation can actually lead to innovation. Here, while we were playing all those different patient uh, types, going around in different layouts, there was coming new ideas. Oh, how about we change this? And oh, how about if we have this person here, for example, taking all the patients and leading them to who is not, not having so many patients that day, for example. So there was both innovation in uh, layout and in uh, organization of the processes. And the next case, uh, St. Olhalos Hospital. Oh, sorry, I need to drink something. Uh, there was also a, a test of an evaluation method. Uh, I have tried to test the use tool in one of the center, labor laboratory center. And uh, I had also a couple of students uh, helping me. So it was a walkthrough uh, evaluation. And the route had four stops. And the focus, we chose some focus, aesthetics and usability. The results of that was a broad overview of, of the facility. We were observing how it works. Uh, the observations were very structured following this method, and we made a group summary. What is important, there was surprising additional information uh, that we could get from about usability from user questionnaire of the employees that were in the uh, building. So we could say that observations must be followed by the test because there was uh, valuable uh, inputs uh, from, from the people actually working in the rooms. And I will give you an example. Uh, here, in the re reception, you come in and see, okay, it's very easy for the patient to see that you have to start here if you want to get a, a guidance where you go and what number you have. So we thought mm, it was very easy, very uh, appealing, everybody can orientate themselves. But what we didn't notice, we were actually wearing jackets the people working there, they said, it's cold. It's not very usable for us. And later, in the fir uh, first design, there was actually no glass here neither, so it was just open space. And as you see, it's actually m more uh, levels high, so it's impossible to heat to a good enough degree. So later, the, the hospital added some more glass to kind of help them on this temperature problem, but it was not enough. Uh, so that kind of thing, you cannot, even when you add the place, you cannot notice all the usability issues if you're not working there every day. So in that way, it's kind of, hmm, very good learning. Another evaluation, uh, other evaluation types were used in case in, in the Bispebe Hospital. Uh, first, they used study trips and excursions to other places. And they did not just visit other hospitals, they also visited uh, hotels and airports to look at, for example, hmm, how do they do logistics to learn to the hospital? So that was another type. type. Another method uh, they also used was user patterns and space utilization. Uh, they uh, employed a company to count all the used and empty rooms every few hours in a couple of days. And that was a basis for area calculations and briefing. Because if you kind of just ask users, they will all ask for more rooms and more space. But if you actually look at the existing building, you find out that half of them or maybe some number of them are not used or not very much. So that was another one. 
So combining many of the learnings I have been observing and was told about and read about in literature, I have tried to make a new process. How could the usability briefing look like? Let's answer the research question one. What should it include? I start building it on, we started with the phases. What are the building phases? The phases here are from uh, Royal Institute of British Architects, which is followed internationally. And for helping all the Danish people here, it's the Danish ones are pretty much following it. There's those phases, there's the pre-project phases. And actually one of them is called brief briefing phase. But I say briefing is actually continuing throughout. Concept design, developed design, technical design, construction, handover, and finally in use. So if we look at those design phases, that will be our axis. But we remember that, especially in hospital projects, you start again. Usually when we do any hospital projects, there is already a hospital to start with. And when we're finished, we need to rebuild or add something later a anyway. So we kind of know that this is a process that might go on again. Maybe not in the same scale, maybe just a smaller or bigger, but this is a process that can uh, continue. Uh, on the other axis, both directions, there will be effort. Here there will be shown effort of uh, programming or briefing and evaluation activities. And here there will be activities of user involvement and design. And I have marked what, what is the ideal uh, form? How much effort do you need to do in each of those activities? So the four activities, programming or briefing. We start actually quite high. We start from the very beginning, the programming, finding out some things. Uh, and then the next one, evaluations, user involvement and design. Of course, the design starts first at some point, the concept design. But you already start designing some things in brief. Uh, and we'll go a little in detail. So, for example, in the briefing or programming, we start with an idea, of course. Uh, then we'll make the strategic brief, those that we saw in the previously from other literature. There's the strategic brief, project brief, and detailed briefs, if you remember. So each of them is focusing a little on a different level, different detail. Uh, if we look at evaluations, what can we evaluate in the beginning? We can evaluate different things at different times. In the beginning, we can evaluate both our existing building, <coughs> but we can also evaluate best practice, other best hospital, the Norwegian hospital or some other one. What are they doing so well? Later, when we're in the concept design, we can evaluate scenarios. We can evaluate, yeah. Later, we can evaluate when we have already designed proposals, then we can evaluate them are they working good enough and improve and change them, adjust. And finally, we can evaluate the new building. <coughs> in the user involvement, what is the focus? In the beginning, we need to collect as much input as possible. We need some needs and visions. But later on, we could co-create. We could do this. We can focus, of course, on functions, layout, space and see if we can be very active involving them. Whereas later on, when we pass those stages, we don't want to co uh, innovate anymore. We want to approve and adjust because there will be often some details that need to be solved or some changes that need to be approved or not. And later on, when there is the construction, then we kind of just need to inform, make sure that the users know that <coughs> we still follow the, the plan. And here in the end, there's also something called in literature soft landing. That is uh, teaching the users uh, before they move in the building how to operate the building. Because you probably all mentioned, uh, noticed sometimes, you move to some new building and you don't even know how to open the window. Oh, it's too cold. And uh, so that, can, that kind of often technical things you can learn. So then the users are not working against each other or against the building. Uh, and then you can adjust when things might, some of the things might not work as well as you thought. And finally, there's design, but that we also know a lot about. We start with some size and master planning, 
and then there's some functional design and technical design. And there's, of course, a number of how much activity a spend is growing, 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 and then it's finally over the design phases. And then it's also in the color. Uh, it's still design the same uh, model, but here I also add a table. What do we actually want to focus about in each of those phases? What kind of users? With whom can we do that? Which kind of users can be helping us with the collecting input or co-creating? And which kind of tools and methods and boundary objects are fitting to that exact phase? And then I have a number of uh, examples that I have from the case studies or literature. So that is uh, all together mixed in a pill, uh, the usability briefing model. Uh, here I marked a few of the examples from the case studies in the model, uh, how they were fitting in there. And uh, as I mentioned before, the model was, I also had some previous versions and I have adjusted them with the expert uh, uh, focus group workshop. And we finalized with conclusions. For the first, the research question was, how can usability briefing be conducted and what should the process include? It is answered by developing this process model of usability briefing. Uh, we remember briefing is not anymore just one phase, but it is a continuous process with changing focus. Um, and uh, it's also important to allow both the briefing and design uh, to interact with one another. Conclusion two. How, uh, how to capture the user needs uh, and experiences. So involve the users actively during the process. They should be continuous throughout the phases as shown in the model. And do the participatory workshop, co-create with them. User groups, they should be defined early uh, and the process should be managed. Users can give input both to briefing and design, and they can also be involved in evaluations. And also use the, some creative boundary objects, but also the relevant boundary objects at the workshops. Use some design games and simulations. And evaluations, there's also a conclusion about that. They are not just happening at the end. They are also happening at the front end of the design processes. They can give input to both the briefing and design with new uh, information. Uh, and evaluation can be integ uh, integrated part of the process, as I said before. Different things can be evaluated. And to finalize, if we do all this, then we might uh, end up, uh, if we should remember, as Churchill said, 